So, hi, Jen. Hi, Mitchell. How are you? You know, I'm good. Back from spring break. Back from spring break, the weirdest spring break I've ever had. I was actually supposed to be in Italy this spring break, which obviously. Oh my gosh. Work. Yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, canceled that trip. And um, yeah, it's been the strangest spring break ever. But I was I was glad today to, to start a normal schedule, at least to be back right. to work. Um, right. nice. And to get to see all my teachers today was was nice. So that's awesome. Um, yeah. Hey, what'd you get your PhD in? Uh, in educational leadership K-12. Okay. So my master's is in educational administration. And then I went back to school and got my doctorate at DBU in educational leadership, specifically in the K-12 environment. Okay. And yeah. how long have you been a principal at Parrish? At Parrish for five years. Um, okay. And before working at Parrish, I was in Richardson for the first 17 years of my career and spent seven years as an assistant principal and a principal within the public school system. So I have experience both in public school and in independent private school. Cool. Are your are the parents at Parrish like, are they freaking out a little bit about like managing it all? You know what? So far, I mean, we haven't started yet. Today we did teacher training and then okay. Wednesday we do student training. And so, so far the emails I've received have been um, either just really encouraging and, and just Good. kind of out of gratitude of thank you so much for working hard to get ready for this. Um, and a couple of emails kind of, I, I got one this morning from a parent that just said like, we can do hard things. Like we got this, we can do this together. Um, and then a couple of just a, a little bit of anxiety of, of how they're going to manage it. Um, but right. not too much yet. I, I sort of anticipate that once we launch it and it gets started, that that's when we'll start right. to get emails of right. just questions and needing support and kind of sharing. I mean, we're going to encourage our parents to share with us what's frustrating for their, for their children. Mm. Um, because this is unprecedented. Like we've never, I didn't go to school to sit in my, at my dining room table and try to teach and lead teachers that way. Um, right. so all of this, it's, it's super unprecedented. And, and so we're going to really encourage our parents and I would encourage all parents to just communicate, um, with their schools and with their teachers, because, we don't, this is new for us. And so we're, we've made the best plan that we can, but I, as I told my faculty today, I have no doubt that it's, it's certainly not perfect and I'm not even sure it's great yet. Um, mm -hmm. And so we're going to, and we're not there to be able to see the students and see how they're doing, you know, so much of. Yeah. Like how do you even assess like if it's working or not? Right. Exactly. I mean, so much of teaching is you know, I remember when I was in the classroom, you would create a lesson plan, right? You would come up with this great idea of what you were going to do. Right. And you had to change it two or three times in the course of, of a 45 minute lesson, because you would just see as the students engaged with you, what was working and what wasn't. So, you know, the nice thing is we have this video conferencing, which will help. Um, but it's, we don't have that, you know, sort of immediate feedback from the students. Um, and so I, I think what one thing that I would really implore parents to do is to communicate. Um, and I think often, you know, I'll, I'll get communication from parents in the first line or the first sentence out of their mouth if we're on the phone is, I'm so sorry, I, I'm really not a complainer. Um, and I, I think it's important for parents to realize that we don't perceive it that way, you know, as long as they communicate in a respectful manner and, and just share like, hey, here's what's happening at our house right now. And here's what we're struggling with. Right. We, we need that right now because right. we, we don't know what it looks like. Um, and so that's, that's just one piece of encouragement I would give to parents is not to be afraid to reach out to their child's teacher or to their child's principal to give feedback because we, I was reading, um, some information that we got from a school in Seattle and they've been doing this obviously for longer than we have yeah, Seattle yeah. Was where it sort of started not where it sort of started where the outbreak started and so um we got an email last night from a school in Seattle which it's been awesome just the network of schools communicating with each other um and they shared all their communication that they had sent to their families and to be able to read that and to see how their plan has evolved. Like the plan they launched week one isn't the plan that they have week three because they've realized right. they've had to make changes. And right. we can't make those changes as educators unless parents talk to us. So 
Yeah, y'all did not have the pandemic plan in the desk. You didn't just like dust it off and like enact it, right? No, like, I mean, most schools will have like a snow day plan, right? Or like, I think <laughs> back to uh, the year that Dallas hosted the Super Bowl and we had that uh -huh. unprecedented five, you know, five snow uh -huh. days in a row. Mm -hmm. And so after that, I think a lot of schools kind of created a, what if we miss a week of school again plan? Right. And we, we had one of those at Parish and we kind of looked at it and it was, just insufficient for this because who right. plans for what could conceivably be two and a right. half months of school being out? So right. So yeah. um, so we know it's unknown. Like it's going to be challenging. They're going to be like some adjustments to the plans and adjustments. I'm sure at home, and we're all trying to figure it out. But if you think like okay, um, to give. Uh, your child and yourself the best chance of success in this like unknown amount of time that we're going to be educating at home mm -hmm. do you have a sense of like some things that would be helpful regardless of what the plans look like like totally. talk yeah. about like physical space what is sure what does it need to look like in the home yeah so um i think one thing i would encourage is even before starting with physical space is just how you approach the day so, you know, we, we sent an email to our advisors to talk to our students about like, please don't wear your pajamas to school, like mm -hmm. you're still coming to school. So as parents to set up the day as if they're going to school, you know, to get them up, feed them breakfast, just like you would on a regular school day, have them change into some sort of appropriate school clothing. It doesn't have to be a uniform, right? I mean, DISD right. has uniforms, it doesn't have to be a uniform, but not their pajamas, just to sort of just kind of activate the mind and the body to know like, okay, I'm starting school. I'm not still right. in my like sleepover clothes. Um, so I think just starting with that, um, if you're able, every home is set up differently, obviously, and every family has different spaces, but if you're able to set up a designated space for your child to, to do school, um, so whether it's a desk or whether it's, you know, sort of after breakfast, turning the kitchen table into the desk area and, and having supplies ready for the child. Um, because I think, you know, we all know that parent, there's a lot of parents out there who are also trying to work while they're doing this. So, yep. you know, gathering the things that a student would need and, and every age of student is different. You know, elementary school students are, might need crayons and markers where high school students need a computer, right? So gathering together the supplies that they need and, and setting up an academic area so that they know when they're in that space, they're going to do school work. And so like in my own house, like right now I'm sitting at my kitchen table, but it has my monitor and my keyboard and my planner and all the things I need to do my job so that I know when I'm sitting in this space, like I'm not surfing. It's time to do the work. Yeah, yeah. like I'm, I'm not like, you know, refreshing CNN constantly to see what's happening. Like this is my workspace. And I have another space where I can, you know, mm. socialize or whatever. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, just as much as possible, make it like being able to signify visually to a child, especially when they're younger, this is your workspace. And when you're sitting here, mm. you're going to do your schoolwork. And when you're not sitting here, you can do other things. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. And would preferably that be like in a different space than where the parent is working? I mean, like... You want I separation? Mean, I, if they're old enough to do that, right? Like I think yeah. also for a parent's own sanity to not have your child right there, um, you know, because kids are are independent at school. I mean, they have a teacher there who's monitoring them, but the teacher's not sitting next to all 22 students in their fourth grade class. Um, right. So, you know, students are used to having to work by themselves for, a you know, a chunk of time without an adult constantly checking on them. Um, so yeah, if you're able to sort of have a separate space, even if it's just across the room where you can kind of keep an eye on them if they're younger, but they're not right next to you, I think right. that would be helpful um, because it also just builds that autonomy, right? Um, kids aren't used to having their moms and dads, stepmoms, stepdads, whoever it is next to them all day going, what are you doing? What number are you on? Do your next assignment. Like there, that's, that's weird. normal for them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I think, you know, helping them have some autonomy and independence if they're old enough to do that is, mm -hmm. is going to be good. What does the schedule look like then? 
Um, does it need to look like a normal school day? And I mean, yeah, talk about about how you think like the days should be scheduled for, yeah. for our kids. Um, so I think it depends on the age. Like I know for us um, at our school, middle school and upper school, we have a set schedule for the kids. Um, so they check into each class at a certain time because we felt like at that age, that structure was appropriate. And also their attention span is long enough to do that. But we still built in, you know, 15 to 20 minute breaks between each class. We still build them in an hour for lunch. We have PE scheduled for them. So if your school gives you a schedule, if they're an older child and there's a schedule to follow, great. Um, you know, middle school and upper school kids are also autonomous enough to be able to follow that schedule. They should be able to do that without you having to micromanage them. If they're younger than that, I know a lot of schools, especially at the elementary level are just each day giving a suggested list of activities to do. Um, they might give some specific math and reading lessons, but a lot of it is, you know, sort of like, here's your list of things to choose from and figure out what you want to do that day. Um, and so I think, you know, one, I think it's important to have a schedule. Um, and so to create a schedule so that this, the child knows this is how long I'm going to be working. Um, within that schedule, though, it's really important to, to put breaks in. So whether it's, you know, a break for to go outside in the backyard and play or to go on a family walk or, you know, students don't go to school from eight to three and sit there and do academics all day long. They go to music, they go to art, they go to PE, they go to recess, they go to lunch. And teachers build in breaks throughout the day as well. Um, and they walk from class to class, right? I mean, right. it's these like little breaks too. I mean, right. I remember it, my favorite part of school was uh, being in the hall and jacking around. So like, Shocking. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, like allowing kids the ability yeah. to like get up and like fiddle with something for a few minutes is like, you know, seems it's like an appropriate time. way. Yeah. yeah. And then I think the other thing when you're building a schedule with them is to give them a voice in it. So, you know, giving them some choice. Like I've seen a lot of um, my friends who are parents who will just set like an academic time, not necessarily you must do math, you must do spelling, you must do your reading. Um, and what we do with kids, even as young as kindergarten, when I was an elementary school principal is, you know, at Parish we create what's called a playlist. And so it's just basically a list of activities and, and assignments that need to be done that day and let the child choose what order they want to do them in. So some kids will tackle the thing they, that is their least favorite first just to get it over with. And other kids will do their favorite thing first and, and save whatever is their least favorite to the end. But again, it's about giving them that choice to feel like right. they have some control over their own right. learning. Yeah. Um, so I think that's, that's super important for them to, because right now their world feels really out of control. Um, they're not in their normal schedule. They're not going to school like nothing. For, I mean, even as adults, our world feels super out of control right now. So, you know, anything that we can do to give kids some voice in what they're doing, um, and especially if the school has given you options. So, you know, if the school has said that a fourth grader needs to do 30 minutes of daily reading and hasn't given them a specific mm -hmm. book, let them pick. Um, right. because they, just, they need that. And they're more, they're going to do it more if right. that's what they want to do, right? Yeah, I find that, uh, you know, obviously today's day one for a lot of parents and kids. And so I'm sure it was a, a hot mess uh, there for a while. Um, I think, you know, the challenges, and even I see this in cash, he's too, right? I think the challenge is like, when we feel really anxious, obviously we bring that anxiety to into the room. And so like, and we, there's a good reason for us to feel anxious, right? Our world's flipped upside down our kids' worlds are flipped upside down. Um, and so I think like managing um, managing those emotions is really helpful. Uh, Jenny actually did a great uh, interview yeah. like this about, mm -hmm. um, about knowing our emotions. And so I think like part of it is building on this idea of like knowing where we're at on any particular day and yeah. like looking for um, if we have the ability to have another parent in the house or another adult in the house to like help you know, participate in this process when we mm -hmm. feel particularly at a bad, in a bad spot. But, yeah. um, but the challenge, I think this is the biggest one and I'm holding up Cash's crayon because I'm sitting <laughs> at where he like hung out all day, right? Yeah. Uh, 
work like working from home Mm -hmm. and like having our kids at home doing schoolwork too like it seems impossible and we only have one kid needs two right right and I and I think like two-year-olds are probably harder because you can't (laughs) they haven't you know the theory is that children have an attention span of however many years they are so two-year-olds have a two-minute attention span um and so yeah, so that it's it's harder, obviously, the younger that they are. But if you have older kids, um, you know, one thing that I would suggest is I, I think as much as possible, things need to be visual for students. So if you create a schedule, the schedule should be visual and something that they can follow, right? So that they know at this time I'm doing this, I'm going to do these three things before lunch, you know, so on and so forth. And the same with if you decide to create a playlist for them of here are the things you have to get done today you know, something that they can just check off so that they know what they're doing. Um, But I think the other thing that can be really powerful for kids that's visual is a timer. So if you've got like a kitchen timer or a timer on an iPad or a phone or your computer or whatever, especially if you know, like I keep thinking of parents, like we were joking before that I've been on five Zoom calls today and as a school, like usually I'm on zero because we don't, we just talk at school in person. Um, but as a parent, you know, if you know that you have a call that's half an hour to set a timer for your kids, you know, and to say like, I'm going to be on this phone call for 30 minutes. Now, obviously with cash, she's two, that doesn't work, but with older kids, it would work. Um, so that they're able to know and see like, okay, if it's not an emergency, I know that I can talk to my parent in 18 minutes because I can see that on the timer and let the timer count down. Um, and I think you know, it, that's helpful for, for students. I used to use that ease, even as a teacher in the classroom, like, you know, I would set a timer for a student and say, I need for you to write for 10 minutes and that's it. And once that timer's done, you can be finished. And the funny thing is a lot of times, you know, by that time, the student will kind of be in the groove and they'll just keep going. Like at that point, the timer's not important, but it's like getting them, it's, I sort of equate it to running, right? Like if, you, and I hate running now, but if you're running, the first three minutes are awful. And then once you sort of get into that rhythm, it, it becomes easier. And it's the right. same for really any task that we do. Right. Um, I think the other thing that's really important and, you know, obviously every industry is different, but I would really encourage parents to also just advocate for themselves as parents right now. So if you're on scheduled for an hour long Zoom call to say, hey, at the 25 minute mark, can we pause for five minutes because I need to go check on my kids. And probably there are eight other people on that call that need to do the same thing Um, and then come back for the second half of the call. So I think, you know, as, and I I think about that today as we had an hour and a half training today that I should have done that, right? Like as, as the leader of that training, I should have said, we're going to stop here for five minutes so everyone can go take care of what's going on in their house. Um, And so I just, I think we need to be, if we're someone who's leading an organization or a group of people to be conscious of that. Um, and if we're not the leader to, to feel like we can speak up for our own family's needs to say, right, you have to advocate for our own families, right? Yeah. So I think, wow. that's yeah, that's good. Part. That makes sense. Um, how stressed should parents be about, um, making sure that their kids are staying, um, up to speed or, or progressing, um, how, you know, we, we think they should or how the lesson plans mm-hmm. uh, kind of demonstrate um, this kind of progression in their education. Because this isn't, you know, just two or three snow days. We're, we're talking about probably several weeks here, a couple right. months, who really knows? Like, should parents be really concerned about like, okay, like we need to make sure that our kids are, you know, keeping up? Um, is it something like, you know, give some grace and um, patience in the whole process? Like, can you speak to that a little bit? Sure. Um, When we started our training today, the two words that I gave to our faculty and that I would give to parents and I would give to students is compassion and flexibility. Because as we talked about at the very beginning, like no plan that we create right now is going to be perfect. So we have to be flexible to know that that plan is going to change. Right. And we have to give a lot of compassion to everyone in this situation. Like I need for parents to give compassion to teachers that this is new for them and and some of them are not going to adapt to this super easily it's going to take them a little bit of time Mm -hmm. um we need to have compassion for students that we don't know 
what their home life is like. You know, for so for some students, they could be, you know, their parents could be at the grocery store stocking our groceries and the 10 year old is taking care of a four year old, right? Like we don't right. know. Um, and the same for parents, like, you know, we know that there are parents who are medical workers and first responders that can't be there to, to help their child walk through this. And when they get home, they're exhausted because they've been taking care of all of us all day. So mm -hmm. I think we have to be super compassionate. So as a parent, um, you know, I would, I would encourage parents to do their best to try to make sure that their child is doing something academic each day, even if it's just reading a book together, right. For little ones, like mm -hmm. just trying to do something structured and academic. Cause I just also think that's good for students. Um, but I think as, um, an industry, as it, for lack of a better word, like as educators, the start of school next year is going to look different. Like we're going to have to know that we have students right. who are starting third grade who didn't master everything that a second grade really have to yeah, second, like it was second mm -hmm. grade, like only halfway through, right? Yeah, so. that really finished like 2.7 years of school, right? Right. Um, so, I, I mean, that's something that as educators and as school leaders, we're going to have to tackle next year because no matter what, I mean, realistically, I would love to see our students back in school sometime this academic year, but I'm not sure that's going to happen. And so we have to know that students are gonna to come to us next year, probably not starting third grade where third graders typically start or not starting their sophomore year English where sophomores usually are because they're just not getting the same quality of instruction. And even if, you know, I, I like I think about my faculty members that have kids at home, they're, you know, they're spending so much time teaching their own kids, their own students that they're not teaching their own kids, right? So none of our students are going to get the same quality of education that they would typically get in a classroom. And, and so we're going to have to adjust to that. Mm -hmm. And it will depend on how long we're out of school, how much we have to adjust. So, you know, it goes back to what I said at the very beginning that I, I think it's really crucial for parents to communicate. So if, if, you know, you're not, if your child isn't getting their work done because they just can't, right. Because your circumstances at home don't allow it to happen mm -hmm. for whatever reason, then let the teacher know that. Um, and yeah. they can adjust plans to meet those needs possibly, or, or as the teacher, they can just adjust their plan, you know, potentially for the entire class because right. that one child will not be the only one experiencing that difficulty. Totally. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and that's where that compassion comes in. And, and you know, the other thing I would say about communication that I would just sort of implore parents to do over the next couple of, of weeks is, um, just to write a note of gratitude, a note, like an email of gratitude to the teachers because yeah. I have seen them sacrifice their spring breaks. I have seen them, you know, jump into this just ready to go and, and nervous. You know, I had one this morning tell me like, I'm really nervous about this. And she's probably my teacher that technology is the toughest for her. And so she said, like, I'm really nervous and I'm a little bit anxious, but I'm, I'm going to be able to do this because I, I have support and help. And so, you know, I think teachers are navigating something that um, is really challenging for them. And um, so I think, you know, I would just encourage our community and our parents to really support them, even if it's just to write them an email to say thank you, um, because mm. they're, they're stressed. They're just as stressed as parents are right now. Um, totally. Yeah. <laughs> they're yeah. trying to figure out what it is. So, yeah. Um, there's a bit of a delay between our live feed and what's showing up in Facebook. Um, so, I want to give folks a, a chance to ask a couple questions before we end. So, uh, while people are thinking of their questions and putting them in the comment section, if they have any, I'm just curious like, how are y'all making decisions about when you come back and like, what does that process look like? And yeah. um, I know y'all aren't directly tied to, you know, what school districts around y'all are doing, but like, how do you see this playing out long-term and, and are you, are y'all taking guidance from the state? I mean, what does this look like? Yeah. So, I, I mean, we're taking guidance for, from a lot of sources. Um, you know, we are not tied directly to a school district. Um, and so we, you know, once a week we have a call together, a lot of the independent schools in Dallas where we talk together about what our plans are because we wanna we want to try to tie our decisions um, together so that it's not just one school doing something totally random that no one else is doing. 
Um, so we, we have those weekly phone calls. Um, obviously, I mean, the governor shut down all schools, public and private, through April 3rd. Right. Um, so that was, you know, Governor Abbott made that decision. I wouldn't be surprised if that decision gets extended. I mean, both Kansas and Virginia have already shut down their schools for the rest of the year. Like both of those governors made the decision that they're not coming back. Um, we also, like, I know that our director of health services, our nurse that's in charge of our health program at Parrish, um, is on a call at least once a week with a bunch of other school nurses with the, with county health services. So she's talking to epidemiologists and doctors who work for Dallas County and getting information from them and getting advice from them. And then we also are following CDC guidelines. So, you know, this isn't just a school deciding randomly, like, Meh, We'll close for a couple of weeks and see what happens. Like it's really taking the advice of government and health officials. Um, mm -hmm. And ultimately what we feel like is best for the community, right? Not just best for our school community, but the community at large. Um, because, right. Right. You know, if, if children are coming to school and, and, you know, kids are fantastic, but they're not the cleanest little people in the world. Um, and so if, you know, if they're coming to school right. and someone's not well, I mean, <laughs> they can spread like wildfire and then go back to their families, right? right. And spread more. Totally. So, um, yeah, they're, I mean, we're trying like those, that last week before spring break, we were constantly reminding them like, wash your hand, don't touch your face, you know, but they're little, like, they're you know, little kids, they're little children. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I really appreciate it, Jen, for jumping along. Yeah. Um, I think it's been really, really helpful. Uh, I imagine, uh, you know, if this goes away, I think we're beginning to think it will. Maybe we'll do this again in a few weeks and just say like, all right, like, let's see how it's going. You know, there, I, there, I don't see any questions on Facebook. So um, well, and if people watch this later and they want to pop a question into the comments, I can just go cool. back to the White Rock Facebook yeah, page. And that'd be awesome. Anything. But, you know, again, yeah, I awesome. just go back to compassion flexibility, communication. Like I think if, if, if we on both sides of this, right, both the school side of it and the home side of it can practice those three things, then we'll get through it together. It, it may not be right. pretty and neat, but we can figure it out. So. Um, the Brene Brown podcast that you. Yeah. So I, um, I told my faculty this, this morning when we started our training, um, you know, one of the things that's kept me sane over the last couple of weeks is uh, a lot of yoga and a lot of long walks up and down Swiss Avenue. Um, and so I was listening uh, on Sunday, actually, after church, I went for a walk and was listening to Brene Brown's new podcast, which I think is called Unlocking, but it's the very first episode. And she, um, it's fascinating because she talks about how she was about to launch this podcast, she was so excited, and then coronavirus hit, and she had to kind of rethink it. Um, so her first episode, she redid, and it's all about what it looks like to to try to do really hard things. And she talks about that as it as adults, we're often afraid to do new things because we don't want to fail, yeah. right? We know the things that we're good at, and we tend to go towards that and not try the new stuff. And so she just talked about that this is a time when we're all having to do new things. And she kind of walks through mm. how to manage that anxiety and, and what that looks like. And I just thought it was perfect timing for me to listen to it um, as a teacher and as a leader. Um, and I think for parents, she also talks about at the very end of the podcast, she talks specifically about the coronavirus and how to, to go through the mm. steps with kids, which I think is super right. helpful from wow. the perspective. Um, it's, it's just really good. I, I have a ton of respect for her. I think she has really great things about leadership and vulnerability. And, you know, as I told my faculty, this is a time where we have to be really vulnerable to be able to say, I'm struggling with this. I need help, you know, right. all of those things. Um, and so I would encourage, um, I would encourage everyone, not just parents, but I think everyone would benefit from listening to it. And she cool. actually, when I was looking it up last night, because she kind of has three steps that you're supposed to go through. So I was looking it up last night to be able to write down those three steps for our faculty. And when I Googled it, she actually wrote one specifically about this for kids um, and like, wow. you know, for parents to read about how to do this with kids. So it's just a really great resource. Um, and I just cool. encourage everyone to give it a listen. Will you throw that in the link or, or in the comments? Will you link it? Sure. Uh, final question for you, yeah. which local uh, food joint are you going to support this week? 
Uh, so I've been thinking about that. I was, I'll be honest, I was a little hesitant at first, but I got the clearance from uh, one of my friend's moms who's a public health nurse that she feels like we can get takeout. So um, okay. I think on Friday, I have a lot of food in my refrigerator right now because I cooked everything. Um, but I think on mm-hmm. Friday, I'm going to end the week by getting a, a veggie burger from Lakewood Landing. Solid. Yeah. What about you? Yeah. Well, we ordered a family meal from uh, De Leon, De Leon for provisions. Nice. Yeah. Uh, and, um, we are also probably going to hit up Hello Dumpling. I keep, nice. I keep, I keep bragging on that place. So we'll probably go there. Or, yeah. I don't know. We do have a lot of food in the fridge though. We got to eat it. I know that's kind of why I thought, but I was like, you know, by Friday, I'm not going to want to do anything. And so the, I can walk to the landing. So I just might walk up there and get it together. Yeah, totally. It. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Jen. I really appreciate you, you're all that you're weekend. doing and um, good luck uh, tomorrow. Yeah. Thanks. And Wednesday when you do student orientation. Yes. Yeah. Wednesday is when we launch with kids. So I think we're at the point where we're just really anxious to see them. So it's going to be good. Yeah. yeah. Cool. I'll, uh, I'll catch up with you soon. Thanks for taking the time. All right. No problem. All right. All take guys, care. Good luck. Uh, bye.